It's been more than two months since the so-called release of Counter-Strike 2 and I think many would agree that the game is still in some sort of open beta right now. Developers rushed a bit under community pressure due to the promised summer release. And no matter how anyone, including myself, tried to come up with a logical excuse, the numbers speak for themselves. Recent Steam reviews have become mixed right after the release and the hype-fueled player base has experienced negative growth of up to 25%. However, according to the developers in a recent exclusive interview with PC gamers, such an early release despite all the problems will allow them to bring CS2 to the desired state much faster than the sluggish development and support of two versions. Hey everyone, Max at the microphone again and all this time I haven't released any videos because there was simply nothing to talk about. In fact, the developers released a bare bones skeleton gradually adding the meat that was available for years in the previous version. However, However, thanks to their small actions in the process of refining the game, communication on Twitter, Reddit and that very PC Gamer interview, a puzzle has formed in my head. And today I'll try to find out what we can expect in future updates, so let's get right into it. First and foremost, we need to figure out where all the missing game modes have gone. When Counter-Strike 2 was first released in limited beta, fully functional prototypes for absolutely all game modes were already there. In addition, it was possible to write custom scripts with custom game mechanics, as it was in CSGO with vScript. But over time they began to cut and replace all the necessary elements. So the problem is not that the developers are so bad, so lazy and didn't make it to the release. You need to understand that CS2 is not written from scratch and still reuses huge chunks of code from the original game. And modes like Arms Race, Flying Scoutsman, Demolition and even Danger Zone worked almost from very first closed beta versions. So why break and cut something that already works quite well? Fortunately, the worst expectations did not come true and to everyone's surprise, Valve unveiled the mystery. Quote, those modes haven't been forgotten, we have plans to reintroduce popular game modes and explore others. That being said, all game modes regardless of their rules fundamentally depend on solid core gameplay. So in the short term we have been keeping our development focused on the spaces where the players spend the overwhelming amount of their collective time. It's a trade-off and understandably frustrating for players who primarily enjoyed other game modes, but we believe this is the best approach for the long-term success of CS2. It is important to note that all this fuss started around the same time we began to hear more and more about Valve's new tool called Pulse. If you haven't watched my videos, in a nutshell this is a separate tool for visual node-based programming that utilizes two languages, TypeScript and JavaScript using the V8 engine from Google. At the moment developers are already using the system for in-game logic mechanics and all scripts have extensions like .vcs, .vgs and .vpools. But most importantly they gradually begin to recreate the most basic game modes like Wingman based on this tool. And in theory when everything is ready developers may provide the community with a full-fledged Pulse Editor, where anyone can create game logic by dragging visual elements instead of dealing with code. Based on this idea, we can assume that if they have already implemented a fairly simple mode like Wingman using Pulse, more complex, cool and fun game modes will follow in the future. Judging by their actions and now even worse, developers didn't want to cut or abandon any content, they wanted to recreate it from scratch on a more convenient and durable tool base. Even though the Pulse Editor is not currently available to ordinary mortals like us, a good friend of mine Antimist managed to write a DIY compiler for .ts scripts and based on it created a small game mod that was impossible to do at the level of access in a regular CSGO map. The game reads the date, day of the week and current time from your PC. And based on this information the map changes day and night cycle, opens and closes doors and activates certain events. And believe me, this is just the tip of all possibilities. For those who want to experiment with Pulse, Antimist released his work with a basic example on GitHub. 
but since there are no official instructions for polls, you'll have to figure it out on your own. From the very first versions of CS2, we knew that developers were officially experimenting with configs for two popular community game modes. Before they cut support for all modes and vScript, there were templates for a surf and aim maps with boats implemented in Lua. So the current stagnation in game modes as it seems to me is not only because developers face problems in the main game, but also because their second quite important tool is not quite ready. And in the end we should get all the game modes from the War Games group, because we already spotted remakes and ports of all the necessary maps like Lake, Short Dust, Baggage and Shoots in the game's files and promo materials. Plus retakes since there are configurations for almost every map in the competitive map pool. Since developers announced and released new series medals in advance, I don't think we should expect any major updates or Christmas events this year. But you'll find it on Skins Monkey. Just log in on the site with your Steam account and get a gift skin that you can instantly withdraw. First one is completely free, but the more you trade, the more gifts you get. Use code GABEN, select a few of your current skins, pick a new one in the same price range and get up to $5 bonus. Participate in a Santa Monkeys raffle each day and get random bonuses such as increased deposits, XP or golden tickets to have a chance to win in a huge giveaway. Use code GABEN and buy skins much cheaper with a 30 plus 5% top up bonus. Skins Monkey, links and my code down below. Now let's discuss what will happen with the danger zone. The developers are definitely not going to leave everything as it was in CSGO. It would be just foolish to not take advantage of many innovations in Source 2 to fix and improve all aspects of danger zone, as it suffered from the limitations of the old engine. Since the developers officially confirmed the return of Battle Royale in an interview and mentioned that they have plans to add new weapons in the future, I can comfortably say that many of the findings from my previous videos are now pretty much backed up. A new type of delayed action grenade called the Pipe Bomb currently has a blank icon but should work similarly to its Left 4 Dead 2 equivalent. A new beer trap that we previously saw as a reference in the lines of code now has a full model with icons and deactivates when an enemy steps on the button temporarily holding them in place. A new fire grenade called Tripwire that looks like an incendiary with a metal wire that activates after a player steps on it. Or a grenade launcher which was hinted by the developers on the official Twitter account, and which was mentioned in other Source 2 games long before the announcement of CS2. But more interestingly, shortly after the release I mentioned that the color of the new smoke is slightly different when the grenade is purchased and used by CT or T players. However, by playing with the code a bit you can unlock all variables, and then the smoke activates 8 additional colors. Exactly as many as there are teams in DZ. And I assume that instead of some absurd skins for grenades as I thought earlier, this colored smoke will be used for an item like Smoke Beacon, which repeatedly leaked in updates and can be literally used as a Smoke Beacon. By using the Smoke Beacon, one of the teams calls an airdrop to the place where the colored smoke of the team is spreading. However, the airdrop will bring not a white crate, but a black one, which has been in CSGO files for several years. According to the localization line, after one team uses smoke beacon, all players on the map will be immediately notified about the activation of this airdrop and the box will contain some special equipment. The only new section in the danger zone config is called Co-op Paradrop Crate Zero and includes optional drops of one or several items from the list M4A1, AK47, Deagle, Shield, AWP, AUK, USPS, Helmet and Armor. That's it for mods and now we're gonna discuss what's happening with map remakes. Train was shown in the trailer as a touchstone map with PBR textures and we are unlikely to see a complete overall anytime soon, but in one of the recent updates there was a leak with new HR Source 2 train textures, so who knows. Fumpon said that he will work on a complete remake of Cash from scratch after finishing work on a remake of another of his map called Santarini, which was also officially added in one of the operations. A new Cash will take into account all the issues and nuances of the old remake to better fit the current competitive map pool. I already mentioned maps like Short Dust, Baggage and Shoots in this video, but also in the files there were the Canals and the Lake. 
How everything with Laker not so straightforward, because long before the CS2 announcement, during our espionage on developers, they were spotted playing on the map called the Lake S2. And after the release, it turned out that all maps with the S2 tag that we spied in June, July and August 2022 were eventually fully remade. And I think you've already noticed that the only map I haven't mentioned yet, which also has the S2 tag, is the community loved Cobblestone. Fortunately, in its case, more information was leaked, as in one of the updates, developers accidentally or intentionally pushed some path, textures, fully assembled materials and models from the upcoming remake. You don't have to be a genius to guess that the map will be redesigned in a winter style, since the main leaked material is a castle stone with a bland texture of snow, which in its path screams of being related to cobblestone. After the release, developers managed to push more than 20 updates. And a significant part of these updates was aimed at fixing bugs, improving the subtick system and adding new data centers and servers all over the world. Despite the high probability that future updates will also be related to improving the core game, we accumulated a considerable amount of content for one big update, be it an operation or some another event. So let's discuss what else can be expected. Expected. Firstly, the most significant hint at an operation is the preparation for the implementation of full-fledged narrative comics in Panorama on Soros 2. For those who may not know or remember, almost all operations in the Counter-Strike universe used to be introduced with a little bit of lore. These stories revealed the backstory of characters and then gave you certain tasks or sent you on co-op missions. And during Operation Wildfire, they even released a full comic book with four chapters. But after devs abandoned the scale form interface and started developing and then switched to the new Panorama UI, the concept of comics completely disappeared. However, with the arrival of Source 2, it seems that developers decided to bring back some old community-loved ideas. So maybe in the next operation we might see the return of comics, but it's important to note that the entire storyline has always been developing through gameplay tasks in Operation Journal and co-op missions. So if devs are indeed cooking comics, some interactive elements are also likely to be included. Especially considering that the large number of updates over the past 6 months mentioned materials and models from previous co-op missions. In addition to this, shortly after the beta started, for and console commands for an entirely new game mode called Terror Hunt appeared. This mod was found in the config files with other game modes under the same subgroup as Co-op Strike. While regular story missions may be interesting to play once or twice, this mod represents a replayable cooperative map where you and your friends move from point A to point B, clear waves of incoming enemies and gradually progress through the location. You have limited time and each enemy kill adds an additional 10 seconds. By default, to win, you need to eliminate 20 enemies. Interestingly, different updates also included lines related to hitting NPCs with certain melee weapons. Mentions of bots in light and heavy armor for the cooperative guardian mode and lines hinting at the return of the VIP escort mode. Each operation comes with a vast amount of cosmetics. For example, two knives were found, one of which Cook already has a complete model, and just recently a list of chroma skins was leaked which will likely be used in a new case with this knife, another twin blade knife was also found but only in the form of an icon, a placeholder icon for an agency's pack, three collections for weapons, counter strike, pop comics and myth and monsters that might use some old weapon models, plus four souvenir collections for each new remake, such as Inferno, Overpass, Italy and Cobblestone. According to predictions, the first season of premiere matchmaking should end around the end of December. Since the experiment with integrating in many systems and logic from Dota's MMR turned out to be quite successful, I believe developers will continue to test something like that. As I mentioned in my video 8 months ago, one of these features could be FPL style matchmaking. In Dota it's called Immortal Draft and is a separate matchmaking where the two most skilled players take turns choosing four other players for their team. While there are still not so many players with red and gold ranks in CS2, after one or two seasons this idea could become way more relevant. 
On top of that, Dota developers are actively combating smurfs and adding new system to address toxic behavior. And it's literally called behavioral ranks in a code. Each player has behavior points ranging from 0 to 12,000. If you disrupt other players, smurf or engage in toxic behavior, players will report you and your points will decrease. The lower your behavior and communication scale, the more limited your in-game features and the worse your teammates will be. Essentially, it's a similar concept to the trust factor, but in Dota you can visually see what's the issue with your account and what needs to be done to fix it. I think developers will do something similar in CS2 as the current system is too obscure. The only way to know your trust factor right now is to invite someone with a guaranteed green trust level to your lobby and hope that they don't have red or yellow warnings. Lastly, I cannot ignore what is happening with the anti-cheat in Counter-Strike 2. During the game's announcement, we discovered that there was supposed to be a separate section dedicated to anti-cheat on the official page. However, many months have passed since the release and no information has appeared. It can be assumed that this announcement was related to new modules and the VAC Live system, which detects cheaters during the game and stops the match. However, it seems that during beta testing, Valve encountered an excessive number of false positives, where players were being banned for using regular console commands or having too high mouse sensitivity. The current situation in Premier matchmaking for ranks above 15 K is definitely frustrating. But despite people's desires, developers will likely never add an invasive anti-cheat at the driver level. This is a topic for a separate video, but they are still pretty much confident in their decision based on artificial intelligence in conjunction with client and server side protection. The current tolerance for bad actors is probably a necessity to collect as much data as possible to refine the anti-cheat in in long run. Valve as a company has always been against radical measures that could violate a user's personal boundaries or restrict their actions. In line with this philosophy, they are actively working on hardware like different Steam Deck iterations and their Linux shell called Steam OS. While it is possible to release a kernel level anti-cheat for Linux, what's the point if any knowledgeable user can tamper with it? Especially considering rumors that after the success of Steam Deck, Valve is quietly working on the production of full-scale custom computers running Steam OS. Thus, the situation remains unclear. And it is also unfair to say that developers have given up on this issue. Just a week ago, there was a significant wave of game bans, with some flaws, of course, but they were quickly addressed. However, it's essential to accept that this battle will likely continue quietly. And Valve has always chosen a rather wise tactic not stirring up unnecessary controversy. Let's see how they handle it in the next year, but for now use the robot emoji if you made it this far and make sure to hit the subscribe button to not miss my next video. Until next time, увидимся!